Okay, welcome everyone to a new edition of the GoTech webinar series. I'm Valentina, I'm the ES officer. And today with me, we have Claudia from, from the ES community and Go as well. Sonia from GoTech and Dagmar and Jennifer who will be our, our speakers today. First, I will share my screen and share with you the code of conduct of this meeting. Um, please be polite and respectful to the participants and to the speakers as well. You will be mute and you don't have access during the entire presentation. But if you want to ask a question to our speakers, you can leave the question in the chat box. And after the, after the presentation, we will give you we will read your question and the speakers will, will reply to, to your question or to your comment. Um, so please, all the comments, leave it in the, in the chat box. Um, and we will, we will be reading it after, after the presentation. So now I'm, uh, I don't know how to, okay. I think now I stop sharing, okay. Uh, now I will give you the floor to Sonia. She will introduce our, our speakers today. Yeah, thank you, Valentina. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We're very glad to have uh, Dagmar Kubistin here with us. Um, she did her PhD in uh, 2009 at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz in collaboration with the Max Planck Institute. And from 2009 to 2011, she was a research scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry. Um, from 2011 to 2015, she was a research fellow at the University of Wollongong uh, at the Center of Atmospheric Chemistry. And since 2015, she has been the head of the trace gas department of the atmospheric ICOS D group at the Meteorological Observatory Hohen Peisenberg. And our second speaker is Jennifer Müller Williams. Um, she did her PhD in 2010 in atmospheric science at the University of Manchester. Um, after that, um, she was a research associate at the University of Manchester for four years. From 2015 to 2019, um, she was a scientist at the uh, Meteorological Observatory Hohen Heisenberg. And since 2019, uh, she's a scientist in atmospheric icos -D group. Today, they will talk about the integrated carbon observ observation system ICOS, the tall tower greenhouse gas monitoring in Germany. We're very glad that you're here today. Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share the screen. So, hang on. So you can see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. And thank you for the introduction, Valentina. Thank you, and as well as Sonia. And thank you for the invitation to this webinar. In the next 40 minutes, we are going to talk about the integrated carbon observing system in Europe. And especially, we concentrate on the toy tower greenhouse gas monitoring in Germany. But first of all, I would like to thank my ICOS team for the successful operation of these stations. These people are doing the stations coordination, the QA and QC procedure, the data analysis, the model simulation, as well as the data interpretation. My special thanks goes to the technicians and engineers of the team who set up the stations, who climbed up the towers and who do the regular station visits to keep the instruments running and going. So as we already had the introduction by Sonia, what we have done, so I don't want to go into further, just to mention that Jennifer and I, before we came to ICOS, had some experience with greenhouse gas measurements. And if you have questions on below, you see our email address and we are happy to help. 
So we, from the ICOS team or, uh, and ourselves, we are based at the Hohen Peisenberg Meteorological Observatory. So th this observatory is a global gas station situated in southern Germany at about 1,000 meters above sea level. And our main mission is the long-term monitoring of the atmospheric composition. So including reactive and greenhouse gases, as well as aerosols, we have a comprehensive measurement program for ozone, and we also monitor the meteorological parameters. The monitoring long-term um, or monitoring um, the atmospheric composition is pretty crucial um, to understand the state of the atmosphere. So here you see three species, one of or three of the predominant trace gas species um, in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, and nitrous oxide, N2O. And here you see a um, long-term record of over 2,000 years. And what you see on the, in the beginning of the millennium is that the concentrations of all of the species are far lower than nowadays. What you also can see is that the concentrations have been pretty stable up to the 18th and 19th um, century when they started to increase um, rapidly with the onset of, the, of, of industrialization. So one common thing of these um, species are their molecular structure. So they have a dipole moment and therefore they can absorb and reflect infrared radiation. And that make them as powerful greenhouse gases, the atmosphere. So short um, wave radiation from the, from the sun is entering the Earth system and is partly reflected by the clouds and absorbed in the stratosphere. About half of it reaches the Earth's surface and is absorbed there. And being a black body, the energy is reflected back as infrared radiation. So here comes the greenhouse gases into the role. They partly absorb this reflected infrared radiation and also reflect them partly back to the Earth's surface, so heating up the Earth system. So you can imagine if you're having more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you might get increase in temperature. And that we can observe at the Hohen Heisenberg um, Observatory. We have a long-term record starting in 1781 um, with monks from the close by monastery doing the measurements. And you see that the temperature is going up in the last century and decades, following or tracking pretty well the global greenhouse gas CO2 concentrations. And this is not only a local effect. If you look at the global um, temperature anomaly taken here from the IPCC report, you see the same behavior for the temperature. So this leads to the well-known global warming and climate change. And to keep the temperature at a moderate level, political action needs to be taken in place. So in 2015, the world countries met in Paris and they agreed to target the goal to be climate neutral by 2015. And WMO supports this action by the integ integrated global greenhouse gas information system. So, but what caused actually the increase of the concentrations and what makes the concentrations in the atmosphere? <clears throat> so the concentration in the atmosphere is a result about their sources and straight, sources and things. And for long-lived well-mixed species, the change of concentration versus time is the emission rate minus the loss rate, also called the growth rate. And if you look for CO2, what we see that the main major source is fossil fuel um, combustion. So which has dramatically increased in the last thousand, in the last 100 year. And the major thing for CO2 is the ocean leading then to ocean acidification and also from a vegetation taking up CO2. And the rest remains in the atmosphere, leading then to the increase of greenhouse gas concentrations or of CO2 concentration in that case. And on the right side, you see the growth rate, and the growth rate is always positive, but it's not just constant. You see that it's always grow also growing in the, over the last decades. So meaning that the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is exaggerating. And if you look for, C, um, for methane, what are the major sources? You have also fossil fuel, but you also have a big part of agriculture and waste. You also have 
natural um, main contribution from wetlands and that it's going um, that might get a problem as well when temperature increases permafrost is melting and you increase the emission of um, methane in that case the major thing for methane is the chemical oxidation with OH radicals in the troposphere leading to about a lifetime of 10 years for N2O, the major um, sources and things for sources are natural soils, as well as agriculture and the fertilization. The major thing for N2O is the transport to the stratosphere. So this leads to a tropospheric lifetime of N2O of over, of over 100 years in the atmosphere or in the troposphere. So these sources and things are subject to change in the future. To predict the evolution and greenhouse gas concentration model simulation with different scenarios are performed. So the back line with the dots um, are the observation which goes up in that plot to 2011, 2012. So when the model starts, um, or the model one starts in the 90s, you see that the spread around the observation are pretty small, but going further and further in time, the spread goes larger and larger, having a larger uncertainty. Therefore, it's absolutely necessary to maintain the uh, greenhouse gas observations so that we can know where we are going to evolve in time. So there are a couple of different um, atmospheric composition networks. And here you see a selection that is and doesn't need to be, or it's not going to be complete. Um, but these networks covering continuous in situ and flask measurements on ground, as well as on aircraft, as, or as on ships. And there's also the um, total carbon, um, the TCON um, network, so the total carbon um, column observation network, um, measuring the total column of um, um, CO2, and also um, total column measurements are performed from space. But what is absolutely crucial for the atmospheric composition network is their compatibility and comparability between their stations. And because you need to know what you are measure and that you're not going to compare between pears and apples. And you also want to have a high spatial and temperature coverage depending on your scientific needs. And having seen the um, different measurement networks before, you can imagine that combining these measurement um, networks with their different measurement techniques and the different aspects of the atmosphere is a powerful or can be a powerful observing system. And therefore, the networks themselves or among themselves needs to be also compatible and comparable. And another important aspect of long-term monitoring is the long-term perspective. To do long-term measurements, you need long-term funding. So in Europe in 2015, the, um, infrastructure, the research infrastructure ICOS has been established. So the goal for, the, um, for ICOS is to determine the greenhouse gas budgets for Europe to understand or to increase our knowledge um, of, our, of the carbon cycle, to reduce the uncertainties in Earth system models, and to assess mitigation strategies. And these data are publicly available um, for all scientists around the world, as well as politicians and society. IFOS is divided on three major components, mainly the atmosphere, ecosystem, and the oceans. So the atmospheric part um, does the atmospheric in situ um, concentration measurements, whilst the ecosystem measures the greenhouse gas fluxes from the biosphere, and the ocean measures the uptake of CO2 with PCO2 and POH measurements. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to concentrate on the German atmospheric um, ICOS network. And before we started the uh, measurements, you have to do, or we in general, you have to think about where you want to locate um, the stations. So one major thing is that we had to be, or that we wanted to be, or we had to be compliant with the ICOS strategy, which means that we didn't want to be um, close to big anthropogenic sources. 
as we also looked for stations where you already had infrastructure so that there's um, stable power, there is an easy access to the station and that we can also have remote access to the instruments. For the instrument themselves, we needed high precision instrumentation and you need a QA, QC procedure like calibra calibration gases and others. And also it's important to have trained personnel and the network needs to be sustainable. So for the at for ICOS, the atmospheric um, concentration measurement strategy is to do the measurements on tall towers. This is an advantage that because with increasing heights, you have a larger footprint of your area and you also minimize the effect of local pollution. Additionally, measuring at different heights, you get additional information about the profile, which you can use for vertical mixing knowledge. Setting up um, tall towers is time consuming and um, costly if you do it from scratch. Therefore, we looked what are our possibilities and we went to, uh, uh, and we thought about the telecommunication towers to install our measurements there. And we selected these stations based on the location, also supported by model simulations, by the tower structure, how they are accessible and how much they cost actually to do the measurements there. So you, you see the model simulations from our colleague Thomas. He did an inverse model with artificial numbers of stations around Germany. And he looked um, on, at the uncertainty um, reduction when including the observation stations. So on the right, you see four stations in Germany and you see the color code is a reduction of uncertainty. So the more red the color, the higher the, um, or the larger the reduction in uncertainty. And you see, if you have a station in the south of Germany, you get a larger um, reduction, which is good. And when you have no stations like here in the west of Germany, um, the reduction is of course less pronounced. So here you see a model simulation now with eight stations, um, kindly distributed, nicely distributed um, around Germany. And what you see is that you can get um, with these set up a nice reduction in the inverse modeling. So at the end, it is a trade off um, about resources you have and um, scientific demands. So in our case, we ended up with nine, nine tall tower stations um, distributed all over Germany. And we are proud that um, just recently, the German environmental agency um, joined the ICOS program with their long-term observations. So at the moment, we have 12 tall tower stations in Germany within the ICOS network. In ICOS, there are two um, class, or um, two, um, station types, they are the class one and the class two stations. So the minimum requirement to become an ICO station is that you have to have continuous in situ CO2 and methane measurements as well as meteorology. And if you want to become a class one station, uh, additional measurements have to be performed like CO as a tracer for anthropogenic emissions. Um, we also um, doing the, for the, um, class one stations, you have to do flask samplings, which are offline analyzed for additional species like SF6 and isotopolox. And you also need to um, include radium carbon measurements as a fossil fuel tracer in the program. The requirements on the data quality objectives are defined by WMO GORE, and these are defined by the green for the International Greenhouse Gas uh, Measurement Community, and they are based, based on the scientific needs. So you need um, these compatibility goals to infer regional fluxes from the model and from your observations, to detect small trends and gradients, and also to minimize the systematical uncertainty between the stations and the networks. And when you look at the compatibility goal, um, like for CO2, you see the numbers are pretty small. CO2 is about 400 ppm or above 400 ppm now in the atmosphere. And you want to have an uncertainty less than 0.1 ppm, which means you have an uncertainty of a 
fraction of per mil. So all these um, goals are pretty challenging, but for CO2, methane and CO um, with a stringent quality assurance and quality control, um, they are achievable. N2O is a bit harder. The current measurement technique is just at the limit. So um, usually 0.1 ppb is really, really hard to achieve. And it's more going to the extended network compatibility goal of 0.3 ppb. And ICOS, um, the different um, possible instruments are tested and they have to, um, to become an ICOS instrument. They have to um, fulfill some requirements. So there is an absolute, there's a minimum of precision they have to have and um, minimum of or maximum of repeatability. And all these um, specifications are defined in the ICOS atmosphere station specification document as seen below. And for our case in our stations, we use a cavity ring down spectrometer from Picaro, and we also use the off axis absorption spectroscopy um, instrument from Los Gatos. For radon and for radium carbon uh, measurements, um, the instrumentation are provided by the University of Heidelberg. And for the flask sampler, we use the, especially for ICOS developed flask sampler from the MPE in Vienna. Um, for the inlet design, we have to take special care what material you are using for greenhouse gases, um, decarbon or synflex and stainless steel are appropriate material to use. For in our case, we have separate lines for each height and each um, entrance, we have a filter to keep the inlets clean on the inlet lines clean. We reduce the inlet line pressure to prevent condensation. That is necessary as CO2 is highly soluble. And as well, we don't want to get liquid water in our measurement cell and damaging our instruments. However, we do have a Nephium dryer for the Los Gatos analyzers um, to minimize the cross sensitivity to water vapor and to achieve or going closer to the compatibility goals. Here you see a setup um, of the ICOS station. So all the instruments are installed in the container. Before the container arrived, we have to um, make sure that you have a foundation where the container can be placed. All containers are usually pre-equipped at the um, Hohen Peisenberg. And here you see an inside view of the container. On the right, you see the Picaro instruments and the sample line um, or the gas distribution system. Here you see our ICOS team in action where they have to climb up the high towers or the tall towers and installing the um, sample lines. We have arms at the outside of the structure and on the bottom right, you see the inlet system with the filter here. Again, here are our people doing the work with the um, sonic here um, below the antennas of the telecommunication towers. On the right, you see um, the installation of the Synflex line. And to do the job, you have to have a certain level of fitness to climb up the towers. And with that, I would like to thank you and would like to hand over to Jennifer. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay, so let me continue. Uh, so Dagmar already has given you a good um, overview of uh, what the um, data quality objectives are for uh, the ICOS data, or generally for the, the what the WMO compatibility goals are. And I would like to elaborate a little bit uh, uh, on those uh, uh, goals and how does ICOS actually uh, achieve um, the data quality. So first of all, um, uh, ICOS has uh, something called central facility. So this is a part of the organization, organizational setup that supports uh, QAQC. So it's the structure itself of the network that ensures high quality measurements. Um, there are certain procedures in place that uh, are basically specific tasks that the central facilities and the ICOS community could do in order to um, achieve and maintain high data quality. 
And then also, uh, of course, at the level of the station, the station operation and testing that is done there is uh, very important. So I will go into all of these one by one now. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, the orga organizational setup, so the central facilities that are important for the atmosphere or the for atmospheric network, uh, the, on the left hand side you can see are the central analytical laboratories or CAL, um, and we also have the uh, atmosphere thematic center or short ATC. So the uh, CAL uh, is important because it provides uh, standard gases uh, to the monitoring sites and it also analyzes the flask samples that are, are being taken at the stations. The um, CAL is also internationally traceable and uh, linked to the WMO um, Central Calibration Laboratory, um, which is an important aspect of uh, data uh, quality, um, of maintaining high data quality. And uh, the Atmospheric Thematic Center, the ATC, is very important and has a key role for QAQC because it does the automatic uh, data processing, automatic uh, um, quality control and data flagging, and it also provides uh, additional uh, data quality data products um, that can help um, with the QC. So the second point I had on my list was the procedures. So there's different procedures uh, uh, that every station has to undergo if it wants to become an IFOS station. So first of all, um, there are clear specifications, clear requirements for each stations that they need to fulfill in order uh, to become an ICOS station. Um, the second procedure is, important procedure, is the labeling procedure. Basically, this uh, labeling is a series of steps that all stations undergo. Uh, it's a kind of rigorous assessment before they receive the approval to join the network. And thirdly, as part of uh, um, becoming a station, um, the instrumentation, as Dagmar mentioned earlier, they are all tested initially by the ATC Metrology Lab. Um, this is basically to uh, obtain an, a start of instrumentation characterization and to check uh, the ICOS compliance of the instrumentation. Um, further procedures are in place when you're already up and running. So this is to maintain high data uh, um, uh, quality, high data quality. So first of all, um, what's important to know is that there's a centralized data processing chain. Um, and uh, this is all traceable uh, through automatic or um, traceable uh, data flagging. Um, the ATC also provides uh, uh, certain data products relating to a quality control that can help continuously uh, with checking on the data. On another level, um, there is also uh, independent flask sampling, uh, as already mentioned by Dagmar. Um, they help uh, to validate the continuous measurements at the station. And also on a more intermittent um, uh, temporal uh, scale, there are station audits um, by the ICOS mobile lab, which itself is traceable um, to the WMO calibration lab and the ICOS calibration lab. And of course, uh, um, on, a, um, on a different level, um, the ICOS uh, community and the, the wider community meet regularly uh, to inspect uh, the data that are being measured and uh, the, discuss the data quality. So I wanna pick up one of the points here. This is the um, data processing chain. Um, so what, um, one of the key things here is that uh, all the data are treated uh, in the same way from all the different stations. The raw data is being sent to the ATC, uh, which is situated in France, and they basically uh, do the automatic data flagging. They do data corrections, such for example, the water vapor correction. They apply calibration factors. Uh, they aggregate the data from raw data to minute and hourly data, for example. And also they provide an interface um, uh, where the station PIs can access uh, the, the, um, the database and can do basically manual flagging. And this is a sort of a final step of validating the um, data or the confirmation of the data validity. 
Um, coming, moving away from the procedures, we also obviously have activities uh, at the stations themselves, standardized tests uh, and normal station operation. So first of, first of all, one of the tests uh, that have to be done about once a year is the determination of the water vapor correction function. In IQOS terminology, it is sometimes called droplet, droplet test. Um, then there are important tests to check the, um, that the system, the whole system is leak free. So uh, there's different types of tests. One is called shelter test, there's also ICUS terminology. This is basically where, um, as you've seen earlier from the pictures, uh, that lots of the instrumentation is within the container. So often it's the, this is the shelter effectively. And here um, the measurement and the standard gas delivery system is tested for leaks. Um, and also what is done normally once a year is the line test. So that includes all the long inlet lines. They are tested for intactness, that there is no leaks or breakages. Um, another important uh, check is um, to look at the gradient data in well mixed conditions. This is often uh, midday, for example, to see whether um, basically there's an absence of a gradient. Uh, and if there's maybe one height sticking out, it could be uh, because there's a, a leak in the system somewhere. Uh, another independent check for uh, the leak freeness of the system is basically the regular flask sampling. Um, here you see an example from the station in Wuhan Peisenberg, where you see a time series. This is most of it is from last year, no, 2019, sorry. And here you see the difference of the continuous measurements uh, minus the flask samples. And the red um, dotted lines there are basically indicate the compatibility goal. And um, we had at the station, we had a, a leak, a small leak. And this basically showed up in uh, larger than compatibility goal differences and uh, action was taken, the leak was sealed, and you can see the blue points um, at the, um, on the right-hand side of the plot uh, show that the differences are minimal, so within the compatibility goal. So uh, the flask sampling is important to maintain uh, or to check on, on leaks in the system. Um, of course, another important set of uh, standard tests um, are the measurements uh, to estimate the performance of the instrument and to make an estimation of the uncertainty of the, uh, the measurements. So uncertainty covers often the two aspects. This is on the one hand, um, accuracy on the other precision. So I've put a little sort of graphic here to show um, this, the schematics, how we can th think of this. So first of all, on the, on the far left here, um, we have uh, a true value uh, that we uh, want to, to measure. And in this case, uh, we have a not accurate and not precise uh, system. We have a, quite a large spread and, and the average value is, uh, has a, is a bias to the true value, the, the red dot. If you look at the second panel here, we can see that the precision is a lot better. Um, the points are more clustered together, but we still have a bias uh, in our measurements are not uh, that cl close to the true value. Um, the third case, we are on average uh, correct. We have an accurate system, but the spread is quite big, so um, it's not very precise. And really the goal for us is to have a precise and accurate uh, measurement system. So uh, in this case, uh, this is what we're aiming for. And how do we achieve this? Uh, we do this by uh, doing regular calibrations. This is to correct for instrument drift and bias so that we achieve this, this true value to come onto this red dot, as it were. And then we also do regular target measurements. Um, so this uh, target measurements, the idea is here that we have a um, standard gas tank with uh, concentrations that are typical of atmospheric concentrations. And we regularly inject the, um, this gas into the, the measurement system and we see how well can, um, can we repeat the um, assigned value of this tank, the, the actual true concentration that is in the tank. Um, this is then used to estimate um, the long-term repeatability, sometimes also called reproducibility uh, of, the system, of, of the measurements. And um, also this is used to estimate the continuous monitoring repeatability, also sometimes called precision. 
Uh, and also in this way, we get an idea of the, the bias. In our case, we also use what we call a reference tank. This is uh, an additional tank that is used um, to uh, correct for short-term variability or drift uh, with the, the Los Gatos uh, analysis that we have. We often have drift that is um, quicker or faster than the, uh, the calibration uh, intervals. So to go a bit more into detail onto uh, the calibrations, um, basically each calibration um, consists or in, in sequence on the left hand side, you can see sort of very simple schematic. Each uh, calibration sequence uh, is made up of uh, four cycles or several cycles and each cycle um, uh, basically is the injection of uh, three or four different concentrations from different tanks. So we have normally a low, medium and high concentration in our um, standard gases. Um, and this uh, whole cycle, this whole sequence uh, takes about takes several hours and is done about uh, every two weeks uh, uh, at the station. And then we out of that, we get a, a calibration correction function, which is then applied to the data. And if we look at um, what uh, this looks like as a time series for, this is an uh, example of the Gato station, um, time series from uh, 2019 to um, current. Um, this is the example for CO2. We see three different uh, lines. So these are the um, three different tanks. And we can see that uh, first of all, the DV this, this plot shows the deviation uh, to the assigned uh, concentration in the tanks. And you can see that this is at the order of 2, PPB, 2 ppm, sorry. Um, so if we didn't calibrate, we would be about 2 ppm off. And the important part of this plot also for QC uh, purposes is to see that these tanks uh, sort of drift uh, equally and uh, um, there's no uh, weird change in the tank for one, but also the instrument uh, uh, seems to behave uh, quite uh, predictably. Um, so this is the part of calibrations and, and being accurate. So now the question of uncertainties. Um, I again want to show a, a data quality plot from the ATC. So this is a pretty big plot. So I split it in two. And this is the top half of it. This is for the station Horn Peisenberg uh, for um, CO2. On the top, uh, you see the ambient air concentrations. And at the bottom, you see the standard deviation in the, in the hourly means that are uh, shown at the top there. And the key thing as part of the QC procedure is really to see do we have any particular outliers here? Is there a, a completely unreasonable low or high concentration um, that we would have to take note of? The second part of the plot uh, is uh, more interesting um, for our uh, QC um, um, approach. So here you see, again, this is for CO2, you see the continuous monitoring repeatability on the uh, top panel or the precision. This is again a time series for Horn Peisenberg. Um, you see the long-term repeatability um, and both of these uh, um, plots are basically data that is derived from the short-term uh, target measurements. Um, so you can see in uh, looking at both that we have um, the long time series, we are at the order of 0 0.02 uh, ppm uh, for the uh, precision. So this is uh, uh, well within the ICOS uh, uh, goals um, and, um, and quite similar for the uh, uh, reproduci reproducibility got quite stable conditions. At the bottom, you see the plot for bias. Um, so this is how um, accurate are we? How well do we uh, find our true value? Um, so here we're talking about the compatibility goal of plus minus 0.1 ppm. And in black, you see the um, data from the short term uh, target uh, uh, tanks. Um, so short term means that uh, the injections happen every six hours or about six hours. And uh, the gray line that you can see there is the bias from the long term target. So the long term target is only injected or measured every two weeks. So here we can basically see that uh, 
um, all in all, uh, we are within the um, compatibility goal of uh, 0.1 ppm. Um, here, the various lines indicate when tanks were changed or configurations were changed. Um, I guess for quality control, uh, one of the interesting points here to make is that uh, we can see at the bottom there's a, a color bar, there's a sort of a, 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 a red period. This was uh, indicates that there was a different instrument connected uh, um, on measuring at the stations. And this is also easily visible at the top plot where you see suddenly this uh, jump uh, in, in precision. So it clearly indicates different instrumentation um, or different instruments um, have different precision. So it's important to uh, track that. So looking at, um, this is just one station, how do we actually do uh, for the entire network? Uh, it's called a theory versus practice. Do we actually achieve it? Uh, Dagmar already mentioned it. Uh, for, um, we do achieve our compatibility goal for CO2, methane, and CO. Uh, here you basically see box, plot, box plots uh, based on the short-term target measurements, and the green bars are the indicate the W. MO compatibility goals. And uh, if we look at N2O, then you can see that uh, we are um, part of the distribution is uh, basically outside of this uh, green bar. So it is more difficult to achieve the um, compatibility goal for N2O, as mentioned before. So what happens uh, if uh, we've done all this wonderful QC on our data? Um, this data as part of ICOS is freely available and you can find this in the carbon portal, which is also a central facility um, of, the, of ICOS. Um, so what the carbon portal also provides apart from freely downloadable data is that it provides additional tools uh, to uh, do QC or to understand your station. It has a footprint tool. Um, it uses Jupyter notebooks so you can explore and analyze your ICOS data. Um, so I encourage you to just have a look at uh, what is all there and maybe if there's something that's useful for you. Um, I wanted to give you a quick uh, look at uh, what do the data actually look like as uh, so we look at the atmospheric uh, ambient measurements. Uh, here you see a time series plot uh, for CO2, methane and N2O. Um, and all in all, this is the... the, the um, the lines or the, the different colors are the different stations and um, the black line is a, a running mean average. And what you can see is that, for example, for CO2, you have a, um, an annual cycle. Um, most probably know this, obviously, in winter time, we have uh, higher concentrations uh, compared to the summer where the vegetation is active uh, and uh, takes up some of the CO2. So um, this is just a quick look, but uh, I actually want to show you what we can do with the data, what kind of science has already come out of the, uh, the observations. Um, so there was a recent study that looked at the uh, summer drought of 2018. So during that summer, we had uh, higher than normal temperatures. Here sort of on the uh, top uh, plot, um, the precipitation was lower. And during that summer, vegetation photosynthesis was uh, reduced. So the uptake of CO2 was reduced. So this could be seen as a signal um, of higher CO2 concentrations, what uh, I sort of call his, uh, what was called here in the paper as a CO2 seasonal anomaly. So what actually happened there and what could we see at the, at the stations? Um, here's an example of the uh, Gato station, German station, uh, so sort of representative for Central Europe. And here's a comparison of uh, 2017 and 2018. And you can see um, that in 2018, the, on the red line, there is in the summer months, uh, July, August, uh, uh, we don't have uh, such a big uh, CO2 drawdown. And if we look at all of the stations, as an example of just one station, if we look at all of the stations here in the bottom uh, plot, um, here basically what is shown is the vertical um, including all the vertical profile information from all the tall tower stations at the top. Um, and what you can see on the left-hand side, we have um, the months May and June. And um, in, on the right-hand side, we have the months July and August. And basically what is plotted here is the anomaly uh, compared to an average um, of all the previous years. 
And we can see that May, June, we actually have a negative anomaly. So there was a more um, CO2 removed from the atmosphere. Whereas um, in the uh, summer period, so July, August, uh, um, we have a positive anomaly. And if we look at uh, this uh, spatially, if we look at the, the, the maps of Europe, then uh, on the left hand side, we can see May, June, mostly sort of blue uh, colors, which would be this negative anomaly that I mentioned, and July, August, um, mostly red dots, which would be this positive anomaly where we have um, um, higher than normal uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And how much was this? Basically, um, this uh, difference was about 1.4 ppm um, in, in the summer period. And um, how does this compare to other droughts where you can see it's um, not the worst drought, but it was clearly detectable um, in the concentration data. So I've talked about uh, concentration measurements and uh, what we can see from that, but uh, really, and we can, from that drought study, we could also see how big is the impact of vegetation. Um, so really, uh, it's not just done with looking at concentration, but the real interesting thing then happens going from concentration to this estimation of sources and sinks that uh, Dagmar also mentioned at the beginning and how they are changing. And one of the key parts is, is to understand what the, uh, in this case, what is here shown on the plots, uh, the net ecosystem exchange is. And I want to um, just uh, pick out um, results from a recent paper. Uh, that use atmospheric inversions. Um, um, I don't really want to go into atmospheric inversions too much. It's probably a whole webinar in itself. Um, but sort of the main points from this is really that this uses different uh, models, uh, different um, also different vegetation models um, that use the concentration data from ICOS um, to obtain an estimate of uh, the carbon budget of the role of uh, the vegetation. And the key point here that I want to uh, highlight is really that what the paper says is that um, the estimates of the, the carbon budget is most robust when you have a dense measurement network. So this really highlights the usefulness of a coordinated structure like ICOS. And here's the example of Central Europe versus Southern Europe, where in Southern Europe it's more sparse network and you have a higher uncertainty in your uh, budget uh, estimates. So, and we're coming to an end, really. Um, I want to just uh, leave this slide up and um, just say, say ha have, a, have a look at um, what ICAS has to offer and leave some of these links up so you can follow up. Uh, and of course, also, as Dagmar mentioned in the very beginning, send us an email if you're interested. Um, and uh, also in, in uh, something, something a bit special, I want to uh, highlight that we uh, currently have a job going at the uh, Observatory in Horn Heisenberg and uh, just check out the ICOS Germany Twitter feed and you'll find the link to the job advert. Thank you much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. We'd like to start a discussion, discussion now. Uh, we have some questions uh, to you and I'd like to read out the first one. It's to Dagmar. Uh, how often do you change the Nafion dryer? So we haven't changed it yet. They are pretty, um, so they are running now for about three years and we haven't changed it. So they are usually, um, they, they don't have a, um, or they are maintenance free, let's phrase it this way. Um, but of course, at some stage you should look if they're still leak tight and um, how the efficiency, if they went down, if you get dirt into your lines. But for that, we also have the filter in front, so we keep the lines clean. Thank you very much. And the next question is, if you can let us know the specification of pump pressure to take the air from the tower. So in Hohen Peisenberg, we have about, um, the outside pressure is about 900 um, millibar and we have pressure of about 300, 400 millibar in the lines.
Thank you. Um, the next question is from Iris. Uh, she says, what are the main difference, differences between in QA and QC procedures between GO stations and ICOS stations? Are there any? So, um, ICOS, I mean, ICOS is a contributing network to GO. So they are not big difference, but what ICOS has, it has the central facility. So the data quality control is centralized. And that makes it a bit easier for the stations um, or for the stations PI to follow the um, data quality um, objectives. But in general, the data quality objectives are the same for GO and for ICOS. Great, thank you. I don't know if anyone else has a question. Uh, there's another question to Jennifer. Even, th even though uh, you used the napkin, is it necessary to make water corrections or only for the flask? Um, okay, so the in, in our in our setup at the moment we only use the Nafion dryer for the Los Gatos, so this would be for the N2O and uh, CO measurements. Um, at the moment we haven't got Nafion dryers installed for our Picaros, and therefore for the Picaros we need the water vapor correction, and the flask sampler. Excuse me. The flask sampler has its own dryer, so that uh, um, that will be dried as well. But this is different uh, uh, at different ICO stations. So some ICO stations do use a Nafion dryer for their Picaro. So this depends a little bit on the station setup. And the next question is, can we use ICOS network measurements to determine global warming potential? I mean, they are coupled together. Um, I can't give you the formula, but the global warming, um, it depends what you're meaning. The global warming potential is actually the capability um, of um, absorbing and reflecting infrared ra radiation compared to the CO2 molecule. So that's, um, so if you look at the um, species, they have the different global um, warming, um, the global um, warning potential. So just turn on. So here you see compared. So CO two is always have a global warming potential of one because you are normalized to that species. And if you're going for C um, um, for methane, you get a global warming potential of about eighty. And for N two O, it's much more powerful, about two hundred sixty. But I think what you mean is actually to get. Um, how much um, energy is actually observed in the atmosphere. And that comes from the global concentration. And the next question, um, Van says, you've shown how the data are being used to calculate average concentrations. Are the data also used to compute vertical fluxes? If so, are the flux calculations based on the gradient gradient method? Okay, so um, the uh, so I can see the first part again. <laughs> I'm sure again, I've got again. It is possible to uh, um, measure or estimate fluxes from the the tall towers, but it is not something that is uh, uh, done um, operationally yet. Um, so, because we have tall tower measurements, uh, in actual fact, you still have to probably in the first step uh, establish a, a clear method. I know there is literature out there that already has done that, but for ICOS, it is not done yet in an operational kind of uh, manner. And the gradient data at the moment, the way we are using it is uh, uh, to look at uh, um, the quality uh, of the data. Like I mentioned, with for example, the um, looking for leaks, um, but it also provides you a lot of information about the mixing state of the atmosphere. So, um, could for example, can I have a look? Uh, because these gradients um, 
are, for example, automatically also uh, calculated uh, by the ATC. So here you can see, sorry, um, this is, for example, the gradient, the CO2 gradients, vertical gradients for, in this case, the Gato station uh, for uh, different months and the different lines indicate different periods in the day. So, for example, uh, daytime from noon till four o'clock in the afternoon, um, you often see that there is an absence of a gradient. This is because the atmosphere is well mixed. Um, and, uh, for example, if you look uh, in August, uh, the black line, the black lines is the nighttime from uh, uh, midnight to four a.m. You see that uh, the closer you come to the surface, the higher the concentrations are. So um, there are either are inversions or you have uh, local um, sources or including, for example, respiration of the vegetation, etc. So, um, but then this, uh, if you look, for example, the August plot, if you go then to the, the day, this breaks up and uh, uh, gets perfectly mixed. So uh, at the moment, uh, the vertical information isn't used in an operational kind of manner, but this is the aim. Yeah. Also for the models to start to use um, the other levels, the other heights, not only the top level measurements. Okay, another question to Jennifer. So you mean that you apply a water correction equation when you measure with uh, CRDS separately from the dry air mole fraction from CRDS itself? Um, so there is an instrument, so basically what this water correction is about is that there's cross sensitivities and this could be instrument specific. It could be different for different instruments. So therefore, you have to kind of track um, how this instrument is in in this aspect, let's say, drifting. So you want to be repeating this test. But maybe I haven't fully understood the question. No, no I think that's what Jennifer said. That's correct. So um, beside the water um, correction or going to the dry mole fraction, there's also a remaining water um, sensitivity on the instruments and which are instrument specific. So you have to determine the function and to correct for. And there's another question, uh, which one is better according to your experience, Nephion, PD or MD type? Um, so I think the one is the multi-tube and the other one is the um, one-tube um, type, I guess. Well, that's my guess. Um, if that's the case, um, so ICO strictly recommends to use the one um, line tubing and not the multi-tubing because there there has been some cross interference and that's strictly not recommended from the ICOS community. And the last one is from Ban. Um, it says, the gradient plots appear to show the effect or formation of a nocturnal inversion that confines emissions from local sources. I don't know if that's a comment or... Yeah, that could be a comment and that is, that is correct. I mean, I guess this is the difficulty of how to interpret this gradient information um, in, a, in a useful way, because obviously, if we do have an inversion, uh, then the footprint um, or the, the representativeness of the measurement is uh, changes. Um, so this is one of the reason um, why, for example, the modelers who use, the, for example, the, do the inverse modeling at the moment use the top level um, measurement, the, the, top, the highest level, um, because then you exactly uh, avoid these kind of things. But Ultimately, there is information in the uh, in the gradient data. So um, yeah, this is uh, surely ongoing work and also to um, establish methodologies uh, on how to um, use this data in a useful way. Um, Ren has another question. 
in one of the plots, there appeared to be a sharp increase in nitrous oxide concentration. Have you been able to explain this? So if you mean on the last, I mean, the sharp increase started um, in the last decades and I mean, one thing is that um, fertilization of the aquaculture or that aquaculture is um, um, more intense. So you get the increase in fertilization and you get the increase in NGO. So that's what's meant with the steep increase. So I think there are no questions left. So we would like to close the webinar. Thank you very much again for your presentation. It was very interesting and we had uh, a lot of interesting questions. We like to introduce our upcoming webinar. It's on Thursday, the 21st of January uh, with uh, Rebecca Chubich lucas from Barbados. She will talk about the Eureka project and you can register on our website. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.